provide a special rapporteur and then subsequently Andrew appeared in the report. So, um, so the report, the headline, the headline features, some of you would have seen them uh, reporting on it in, in the news over the last, last few weeks, a few months. Um, the funding mechanism for the report is that there's a number of different funding mechanisms that are available to the government. Um, the first one is through the Human Rights Obligation. The second one is through the Human Rights Obligation. Nonsense. A quote. Nonsense. He goes on. Of course, there are 
people struggling with the cost of living. I understand that. But the point is that we're addressing these things uh, through getting to the root causes, which is through more employment. Completely overlooking, of course, the fact that there are so many people living in poverty. Um, if you just give me three more unemployment. I just want to get to a sense and I'll just finish off a little bit and then I'll, I'll pick up the questions directly. Mm -hmm. um, a, a spokesperson for the Department for Works and Pensions that, that many people have come, come into contact with in various ways described what Philip Alston has laid out based upon a great deal of research as fairly believable. And the rug, which some people see as the kind of humane face of the conservative cabinet, um, is, is reputedly now um, seeking to lodge a formal complaint to the UN that Philip Alston has somehow been a naughty boy and uh, hasn't been speaking to his, speaking to his family. Um, ministers responded that it was a uh, report of a completely inaccurate picture of our approach to <coughs> poverty and instead claimed that the UK was among, are you ready for this? Sitting comfortably? One of the happiest countries in the world. <laughs> Pointing to the wealth of happiness. <coughs>
Inspector Rocket went to Geneva last week and uh, 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 Phil Alton's report was presented to the UK government and uh, he's finally got that event. So you might want to say a few words on, on, on that.
basically I've seen a lot of you drive, because obviously it's a holiday village, and obviously without the holiday part being here, you can imagine what happened to Joe. So basically I've lived here from 1986 till today, and I've always wanted to give Joe a voice. So basically when Channel 5 comes to Joe, he's about 2015, making his programme, which I didn't know what it was about, I just thought, yeah, I want to be involved, because Joe, and I love Joe. I don't know about the politics of it all. So basically I said, yeah, I'll be in your programme. I basically showed them what I do in Jamie. And uh, I care about people, I try and give people a voice. And when they came back to series two, I thought, I weren't so happy with the first series. Even though I was happy with the wild I played, I weren't happy with what I was portrayed. Because I know Jamie to be different from that. I know people that work every day, drive to London, drive back. There's a lot of positive things in Jamie, which I feel were not shown. So I wanted to do that for series two. So when it came to series two, I said to them, yeah, I do series two, but I want you to help me set up a youth club for adults. And I want to call it the Javik Sounds Happy Club. They all laugh, I don't care what they think, I don't care what anyone thinks. Being in Javik for all these years gives me that right. And basically, I don't think anyone ever cared about me when I was little. I don't think they care about me now, but I don't really care because I've lived in Javik all my life. And it kind of, that's the, um, the, that's the way it makes you feel, you know, Javik. And I know how the young people feel. I look at the young people and I see my face on them, and I know exactly what they need, but it's hard for me to give it to them because I don't have it. But I know what the government can give to them, which is opportunities, a voice. I thought I can at least help the adults. So that's what I did. I, joined, um, I created the Jamie Sands Happy Club. Just an idea for television. Done a few meetings. There was a television Dan Casey got behind me. And, he, and, he, and, he, and I thought, wow, there's no stopping me now. And another woman called uh, Donna Mims, she does all the admin, she got behind me as well. And with a team of four of us, we're ready to take over the world. So you haven't heard of the Jamie Sands Happy Club, you're in trouble. And basically, I think every community all over the world could have a happy club. I don't just think it's for Jamie, I think it's for everyone. And I'd like to work with all communities all over the world to give people a voice. And ever since we've done the happy club, we've had many success stories. You know, I'm not going to go into individual ones, but you know, a lot of people come there to every meeting and we take what they want to be done, we hear their voice, we email the council the next day of all the queries of Jamie, they reply to us, and to me it's just a, it's just a success. And I just think we can all learn from each other, we should all work together, and we are the Jamie Sands Happy Club. And you're all welcome. <laughs>
it's a very inclusive program that I finish coming about. And you know, and, and the, the whole thing is this this whole thing is not just about Jamie. It's it's about the whole of the UK, it's about the whole world really. But the the Essex University are focusing on the whole of East Anglia. Okay? So <coughs> The reason to come to Jaywick, okay, Phil Austin came to Jaywick because his understanding was uh, deprivation, that kind of thing, which is correct. But actually, the event was so uplifting, that it was such a, the, 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 the Jaywick welcomed everyone in, and it was such a fantastic event, it seemed like a no-brainer not to, you know, we had to have it at Jaywick, so it was so good. So, yeah, it's all about inclusivity. So, Rob, please. Yeah, I was uh, involved in the last meeting, Joe, at actually going to test me because I'm on benefits. And I want Jay Witt to take away from me tonight. You know, I'm, I'm a scouser. I was born in Liverpool, moved down to Clapton when I was uh, 16 years of age. And the first thing I noticed, and sorry for people from Clapton, was the lack of the community spirit. And I said, I don't live in Jay Witt. I come down as often as I can. I've been involved down here. I've uh, drunk in the Never Say Die a few times. I've been around Jaywick quite a few times over the years. I've got friends now who've lived in Jaywick. And what I love about Jaywick is that you look out for each other, yeah. you've a community spirit, and if you pull that together and you let other people in to stand alongside you, you can make great change in this community. I'm a really, really sure of that. And it's been a privilege to you know, be here tonight. And you know the love you've given us, the, you know, the boost I got walking out of the meeting in November, and the welcome, it's brilliant. And we want to work alongside you, we want to stand with you. Yeah, <clears throat> I've been captain 32 years. I now I've moved to Jaywick 14, 14th of October 2014. I agree with the chap that's just said. I've moved into Jaywick, and since I've moved to Jaywick, after what I do, which I'm not proud of, but Jaywick is the most caring place I've moved to. Yeah. But the main thing I want to put across, which is on my heart, I've got epilepsy. But there's a lot of people out there which I've tried myself to get work. And as soon as they know that you've got epilepsy or things like that, they just automatically show you the door. Could always be a gangster. <laughs> well, well, it could be a lot of things, but that, that's why I'm now volunteering for free jobs. He's employing people, by the way. Come and talk to me after the show. <laughs> we'll find you a job. <laughs> um, We're finding him a job. Yeah, we've already got him one. Yeah, we have, yeah. If everyone's happy, yeah, supervisor. Uh, we're going to go to the next part of the meeting, which is um, there's a couple of housing. Uh, and benefit type uh, things to focus on. So, Lucy, would you like to uh, do the first one, please? Right, hi everyone. Thank you for having me speak there. I come from the Essex Law Clinic, which is linked to the Human Rights Centre. I'm just going to talk a little bit about legal remedies as a tool for promoting and protecting human rights. We've talked a lot about campaigning, and there's lots of different approaches to enforcing your human rights. I just want to start with something that Philip Alston said in his report. He highlighted the problems faced by those experiencing poverty in effectively don't really mean anything unless you can implement them or you can find a way to enforce them. Um, and he was talking about people not being able to enforce their rights and losing access to critical support, benefits, losing contact with children, I think that's something that came up in Jaywick, and unable to resolve poor housing conditions, which we've heard about tonight, and unable to find affordable housing. And he linked this partly to problems with access to justice. I wish it was just decimation, because that would be more intensively later on, but it's much worse than that. We've lost um, up to a third, and housing cases have halved. And now in Essex, North Essex and Suffolk, there is no legal aid provider, and 91% of residents in East Anglia have no access to housing legal aid. So the kind of issues that you were talking about, you know, legal aid was put there to help you resolve those kind of issues and give you legal support. And that is no longer around. So I'm not here to be the voice of doom, <laughs> although there are you know, some severe problems. I want to put it into the context of what people like the Essex Law Clinic are doing and what groups like Noise Group are doing. So at the Essex Law Clinic, we 
our aim is to promote knowledge of legal rights and to facilitate access to justice. Um, the way we do this, we train law students who we supervise to offer initial legal advice in areas like housing, we talk about tonight, benefits, family law, employment, um, and we focus on social welfare. And we're developing public legal education and law reform for it. And this is to fill, to a very small extent, the gap left by the reduction in legal and advice services. We can't replace legal aid and we can't pretend to, um, but we can help people understand legal options and avenues to resolve situations. And I think someone has already said tonight about you know, knowing what your rights are is the first step to accessing those rights and enforcing them. Um, so if you look at some of the things that Bill Hawkins reports highlighted, and Jude did a good job of pulling out some of the things that were um, particular issues here in Jaywick, but I think also across the country, these issues were echoed across the country affordability of housing, poor housing conditions, benefits issues, you mentioned today discrimination, family issues. Um, for some of these issues, and I'm afraid not all of them, and some of the issues relating to affordability and private rental, there just are no laws. It's not illegal. Um, but we can talk about that perhaps at the end. Um, but there are legal remedies for some of these issues, poor housing conditions, there are a lot of legal remedies. Um, and accessing these can help people enforce their human rights for things like family life, adequate, secure, affordable housing, fair treatment free of discrimination, how homes are distributed, how workplaces treat their employees. These are all issues that there may be a legal remedy for, but it's only one tool, it's only one approach, and it's not the only approach. Um, in the clinic, what we traditionally done is work with individuals um, and individual cases to inform people of their rights and how to enforce them. Increasingly, we're working with community groups um, to and public legal education and law reform to try and have a wider impact. Now, working with individuals and individual cases can have a massive impact for that individual. It has a really important effect. But it has another important effect, which is the ripple effect of cases being resolved. And it have, can have a powerful impact in what in sort of keeping people honest. So it's reminding landlords and local authorities and employers of what people's rights are and what their legal responsibilities are. And because legal protections for rights are only as good as their implementation and can only be used if people know their rights and how the law protects them. So what I'd like to do is just give you an example which will speak to some of the issues that you've raised. Unfortunately, it's not the same as your situation, but it, it, it is related. Um, <coughs> And I want to give an example of how the ripple effect on how legal successful legal challenges can make a difference. And there's been a recent case that was decided by the Supreme Court, which Roy referred to, which is the case of Samuels, the case of a, a young mother of four children with learning difficulties um, against the <coughs> local authority. Um, Ms. Samuels was evicted for rent arrears, quite a familiar story. Um, she had full housing benefit. But that left her with a £150 shortfall for her rent each month as the local housing allowance was set well below local rent levels. And, you know, unfortunately... Which is happening here. Right? It happens, yeah. It's, it's happening amazing. everywhere. And, you know, there isn't any legislation to force the local housing allowance to increase. It's being held at the same rate. While rents, particularly in East Anglia, I don't know if anyone saw that in the paper recently, rents have been increasing um, at an astronomical rent. Um, she went to local authority for help and she was homeless. Now, there are some statutory protections for homeless people, particularly vulnerable people, people in priority need. The local authority said that she became homeless, it was her own fault because she deliberately chose not to pay her rent by not using her other benefits. So because she didn't use her income support and her child support to pay the rent, then she was considered to be intentionally homeless. And these benefits are obviously subsistence benefits. Benefits are set at the lowest, probably below the level of subsistence. You know, they were for her children and her living expenses. So this case speaks to many of the issues raised in St. Paul's report, many of the issues raised here in Jaywick. Benefits cuts, unaffordable housing, child poverty, people living below subsistence levels using food banks. Um, so the council... Yes, making it very difficult for people to access what benefits there even are. So the council were basically saying that they wouldn't house her because it's her fault she couldn't afford the rent out of the basic income provided through benefits. And the case went all the way to the Supreme Court, who looked at what could be considered objectively assessed reasonable living expenses and declared that it was wrong to consider that someone living within the level of subsistence benefits could be intentionally homeless. The rent was simply not affordable, and people shouldn't be expected to live below.
low subsistence levels to afford their rent. Now, the ripple effect of this is within homelessness law, so that's why it doesn't help necessarily <coughs> people in the private rental sector in the situation you were talking about. But it recognises that people shouldn't be expected to live below subsistence levels. And this is what Philip Alston picked up around the country, people being expected to live below subsistence levels. And they shouldn't have their rights taken away from them if they do. And if, it, and if they have rent arrears as a consequence of unaffordable housing, they shouldn't have their right to be rehoused by the council taken away from them. So this is an example of how a legal case can enforce rights that, you know, housing law particularly is a mishmash of lots of different laws, um, protecting rights in different ways, and it's not always easy to navigate. But it also was pushing back at the attitude that people can and should survive below subsistence levels just because they're on benefit. And the consequences of poverty, which in this case was eviction for this family, is the fault of those experiencing poverty. So it's a really important case. And the ripple effect is that housing officers up and down the country, when they are presented with families who've been made homeless because benefit and the local housing house doesn't cover their rent, they can't turn them away and say, well, it's your fault, basically, for not choosing between feeding your children and paying your rent. Okay, and that's why it's such a significant case that, um, that we wanted to bring to you. The kind of reality check of this situation is that it took two national charities and a massive fight with the legal aid agency to get this case funded, and it took four years for Miss Samuel to get her housing. So, you know, it's a test case, it's having a ripple effect, but it was a painful journey to get there. It's not an avenue that's open to everyone, but on a smaller level, challenging local authorities, challenging your landlords for your rights can make a large difference. There's quite a history of councils not complying with their responsibilities, with their homelessness duties, turning people away, saying we don't owe you a duty, you're not sick enough, you've made yourself intentionally homeless, landlords not following proper procedure, not complying with their statutory duties. One or two legal challenges can help people keep people honest. It's not necessarily going to change the whole world, but it can change things locally, and it can change, and will definitely change things for individuals. And that's the ripple effect of legal challenges. They change behaviours. Um, an action doesn't have to be at the level of the Supreme Court, as I think is clear. You know, you can challenge ten room district councils to fulfil their responsibilities. Um, without taking them to court, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Without taking them to court. Um, yeah, sometimes. You don't have to take them to court because they have challenge systems, but the challenge system is difficult. Yeah. yeah, but with help, it can be done. And actually, they don't want to spend the time with the challenges. It's easier for them to actually fulfil their duty to start with. But Not tenuring. I, 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 I'm, I'm really not trying. Tenuring District Council, I've got four separate community, I work in the community support box, and I have four separate issues going on with TVC at the minute. And I have no legal backing on that or anything else like that. They will continue, no matter what it costs them, all the way. Regardless of being totally wrong, inaccurate, not having correct paperwork, even if we presented paperwork to them. Yeah. And they've gone, well, we've got that issue, I think it was issued on this day. Yeah. And it took a solicitor going in there to actually show you who you were asking us, there was barristers and walk away. Thank God. But one of the biggest problems that we've got to see is anyone that's in rented accommodation, families, individuals, regardless, and there's an issue or a problem, and they're given notice of eviction, section 12, or whatever, that as long as they pay the rent, TDC won't help. They insist that you are evicted first, going through a legal battle for the liability. Yeah, and incurring all the costs. Incurring all the costs. Yeah. And you're then told you come back to TDC <coughs> and we'll try and help you. Well, I'll, I'll say I work with families and friends. They can't be living in the back of their car mm -hmm. for two weeks by TDC. So I've got to do And they shouldn't so, be doing that. And there is a new law. But again, it comes to implementation. And it speaks to something that Andrew was saying about and it came up in the autumn report about the funds available for local authorities. There's new homelessness le um, legislation which was supposed to address that, but there was no new funding for local authorities. So this comes on to my final point. <laughs> and I would, be I would be interested to talk to you actually separately about those cases because, you know, and I think, you know, it's been mentioned before, you know, I've worked a lot with Cold Twister Borough Council. They are responsive, they respond to challenges, they respond to legal challenges. Ten room district council tends to be a little bit less responsive. You know, when I, I used to work in shelter when there was legal aid in North Essex, um, and we have been to court in 10 district council, we take it all the way, many times. 
come in mm -hmm. please. Um, but now these loads are not available, so we have to find other ways of, of approaching these things. And so this is the final thing that I was going to say, is that legal remedies have their limits, as proven. So um, they are only one tool in acting for social change. So for example, what we can do at Essex Law Clinic is point you in the right direction. We can help you understand your rights, but we can't take you there. We're not legal aid. Legal aid isn't here. This is the reality that we're now living in. And it comes back to you know, people doing things for themselves with help, with assistance, knowing their rights and taking things forward. If you've got good support groups, people like Bent the Rent, the Happy Club, then there is good community support groups and it's about working together <coughs> based on the right information to make those challenges. But there are also areas where there aren't any legal remedies. Unaffordable private rent, local housing allowance that's too low, Section 21, no fault evictions, that's something that came up in the last Jamie meeting. Um, Have and that been changed? Well, they've started the consultation. And that's why I mention it, because um, there, is, there are only technical defences to Section 21. It's no fault. The landlord doesn't have to have a reason. But because of a number of challenges and a lot of campaigning, the government are now looking to do a consultation when they're finished with their other political oh. shenanigans. <laughs> a consultation is a starting point, but for a, for a Conservative government to be talking about consultation on Section 21 is actually a big step forward. It makes it likely that there's consensus across the parties to do something about it. But then that's not a legal remedy, that's a political remedy. Um, and in many cases, campaigning is the only solution. If you want to stop the freeze on the local housing allowance, that's a political issue. There isn't a legal challenge to that. Um, and with that, with the thought that there are some legal remedies and actually individual situations can be affected and there can be a ripple effect, but then in some situations actually campaigning and collective action and local organising is what's needed to change the situation. And it's about knowing which remedy is appropriate in which case. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Roy to talk a bit more about local organising and collective action. Basically, it's, it's a simple fact. 
a lot of people are worse off and a small group of people uh, are quite a bit richer as a result of reckless trading on the stock market, etc. So basically what, what can we do about it? As individuals we're powerless, the odds are stacked against us, the system's stacked against us. Um, so now I want to kind of highlight three community groups, and they all kind of started around the same time, around 2014, 2015, and they were all focusing mostly on housing. So you've got ACOM, uh, Living Rent in Scotland, and the London Rent Institute. And their ethos was about building power in the community, so collective power in the community. And it, it, it started with, they, there's all independent groups, they're kind of aware of each other, and you know, they, they just wanted to try and stand up for people's uh, rights and stop people getting evicted, that kind of thing. But they started with small things. So there was something that, that they call member support. So if you're a member, and that might mean you've been along to a meeting or you pay a couple of pounds a week or whatever, uh, you know, they, they, they get people's deposits back. People, deposits are supposed to be put in deposit schemes. Yeah. Often landlords would put them in. Then they wouldn't respond when people wanted their deposit back. So then, you know, it led to a lot of difficulty for people getting their, their next home. And a lot of the kind of uh, tenancies were only six or 12 months, so people was constantly moving. Uh, another thing is, like this, we've been talking about it, Section 21, people was getting evicted. Um, people was living in unsafe homes, they was in bad disrepair, but they just be ignored. But with collective action, uh, these groups were you know, they were putting a bit of pressure on landlords, on letting agents, maybe the council to do inspections, maybe the council to prosecute where it was appropriate. And they were getting some small successes. But um, they became, they were aware of the net, no DSS clause in the mortgages. But um, basically, they'd never really worked together in a collaboration before, but they all got together in a collaboration. Kind of what triggered it was, um, there was a, a landlord and they got a remortgage and they had to evict their tenant very reluctantly because they no longer could have that tenant because they were on benefits. So that kind of triggered this campaign. So they called the campaign Yes DSS. Now, you know, we're talking massive multinational banks, very powerful. How are a few community groups going to overturn these banks? But what they did, they organised collect, like they organised direct action. So they decided to pick it and um, you know occupy lots of banks up and down the country, and just go in there and say, we've got this one simple demand: drop the discriminatory clause preventing landlords from renting for benefit payments. So they've done the action. I think. November last year was the main action that, that they took out. And um, the effect was, well, first of all, it created national attention. But then NatWest, I'm going to focus on NatWest for a minute, they offered to consult, consult the groups as part of a review. Later on, they retracted that and then they ignored dialogue. So the renters in these groups voted for further action. Within five minutes of them of NatWest being informed of this, they was on the phone and they were begging for the action to be cancelled. And then on March 2019, they got confirmation. NatWest will be lifting all restrictions on landlords, renting to tenants and receipt of housing benefit, and extending short hold assured tenancies from 12 to 36 months which allows landlords to offer the security of longer term tenancies. So that was a big win. Mm -hmm. Also, TSB, Santander, caved in. So all these banks were beaten by people power. So, like the point I made earlier is, yeah, if there's some people in the world who've got a lot of capital, and they've got a lot of wealth, so they have power, but you can have people capital, and that, and, Basically, as the name over there says, unite. If people unite in solidarity, they can win. Roy, can I just ask that? Um, when you started talking to us, did you say 
mean that the AI wasn't available to the individual? Uh, no, I didn't say that. No, I was Lucy, basically Lucy. saying. Lucy, I'm oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. 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 When you first started, did you say legal aid is not available to the individual? I'm saying geographically here in North Essex and in Suffolk, there are no legal aid providers for housing <coughs> in this area that what? can take things forward. <coughs> when I got my section 21 no fault eviction in February this year, I went through lots of different places in us, and I applied direct to .gov.uk. The Civil Legal Advice Gateway. And I got legal aid granted for my eviction. So there are ways that you can get it. I got it individually, and, and they did, granted it. And did they represent you? But I still got the um, legal aid granted because I haven't got my deposit plate yet. So yeah. my legal aid is to know. Sent him an email that I changed the address. He said, that's okay. Let us know when you, um, you've got an issue and we will <coughs> back you in court. Yeah, so I wasn't so, saying that legal aid is not available, that there's no yeah. legal aid providers in Essex or Suffolk. There's a massive campaign by the Law Society right. because it's what's called a legal aid desert. So it means you cannot go and see a solicitor and there's not a solicitor who can represent you in court here in Essex or in Suffolk. Yeah, well I applied directly to the, to the, the, the civil legal advice gateway. He said, gateway. do you yeah. want to, we well, have to have some solicitors in the area, but we can represent you from, <coughs> they nominate. So where are they? Because I did have time he was represented by someone in Sheffield. I don't know where it was, but I, I've done it all by email with them. Yeah. And he took it on and was on the phone. Um, I can um, <coughs> email the, the um, link if you want. You've got a couple that you can. You yeah, it's Civil Legal Advice Gateway. It's a telephone gateway you can ring up to access. Yeah, um, yeah it's the government. Do you qualify for legal aid? Yeah. And then you put in your details and they get back to you. That's direct from the government. Yeah. Well, it's the same. It's the same legal aid that you would have through a provider locally. Um, oh. So it's the same legal aid, but the, there are no providers in North Essex. So um, right. you know, you were able to be your case was able to be dealt with remotely. Um, yeah. But I've had clients who've been offered legal aid solicitors in London. They've got four children, no money. They can't. They can't go there. Got, what you're saying is you can't go to a solicitor locally, and they apply for legal aid. So there's no legal aid in. Legal aid providers, yes. So legal aid still exists, but then you have the problem that the legal aid providers in other counties are now covering two, three counties. So yeah, if you're lucky right. enough yeah. to get legal aid, you'll be served by someone in Sheffield, potentially, or somewhere else, if, you, uh, if you are. But yeah. part of the problem is that we've had clients come to us who, who've had the telephone gateway service, but it can only go so far. So they weren't able to check their documents or take Oh, yeah, it's got all the documents, everything. Yeah. Everything's done, they sent back, yes, documents are okay. I guess uh, sent them off to by, um, Do you have someone in Colchester who's had a by, uh, just to a section 21? Yeah, I sent, I sent them off on an attachment and said, yes, fine, that's okay, great. Great, yeah. I think. And they dealt with it there, and I never see them. Yeah, it's all the money. <coughs> yeah. Well, that's brilliant because yeah. the laws. It was hard work, mind yeah. you, it wasn't easy. Yeah. Well, but that's brilliant that the Civil Legal Advice Gateway is taking up the slack because yeah. what the Law Society is putting out is that this is a legal aid desert where right. it's not yeah. being served and the same in Suffolk. Yeah. So if the Civil Legal Advice Gateway have got capacity, then that, that is great. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I think I was going to be lucky anyway. I thought no, I'd, it's a really know, good point. Thanks for yeah. raising it. Yeah. Very patiently, Coldo has been <laughs> waiting all this time yeah. and he's got some very inspiring stories to tell us. So. If we let Coldo speak, and then we'll have maybe 10 minutes or so at the end, and there can be more questions, if that's okay. So, okay. Coldo, would you like to go Thank you, pleasure. Uh, all right, so um, thank you, first of all, to United Community and to Essex University for the, uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so my name is Coldo, and I work for a human rights charity called Jasper. So we use reports like the one by Philip Austin and other things that come from the United Nations to document what's going on with social rights in the UK and then to bring about change. And by social rights, I mean things that you guys know already, but housing, health, social security, benefits, welfare reform, these issues. 
So we look at to what extent the reality of this country complies, meets these international standards, and then we work with people to try to, to campaign to bring about the change. Um, so before Billy Boston, uh, this is in November, we produced uh, reports, and these are just two examples right before and right after, where we document to what extent uh, work reform doesn't really meet the international standards that the UK has voluntarily uh, subscribed to. Uh, and these are uh, we have a, a, an open mind event similar to what you guys did, I think, in this room uh, a few days later in in East London, with exactly the same purpose of gathering testimonies and analysis from the people who are struggling with the consequences of austerity. Uh, that was in London, in East London, but we also were with him in Newcastle. Uh, so Newcastle was actually the second or third place that he visited in the in the mission. And Newcastle, uh, these are pictures of him in the, in the Western Food Bank of Newcastle. Newcastle has the dubious honor of having the largest food bank in the country. There are 46,000 people that depend on the food bank uh, per year to, to survive. And these are some of the pictures. And I also included these two messages from Facebook that you cannot read. So you would have to believe me that these messages say very appreciative things, similar to what's you guys have been saying actually today about how important it was to have someone of, of such importance come from, from New York with the whole United Nations umbrella come here and listen to you. And they were making similar points here on, on, on Facebook. So that was from, you, from the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights who visited Newcastle to the next step, please next, to the Social Rights Alliance of the North East. So remember the, the people who was here in November. So a month later, we launched in, in just that, we launched what we call the Social Rights Alliance for the Northeast. And we did it at an event on 10 December uh, 2018, so about a month after the visit. 10 December is a, is a Human Rights Day. And it was the 70th anniversary of the International, the United uh, UN Declaration of Human Rights. So we thought that was a perfect day to say, listen, it's important that Philip Olson was here, speaking of the Northeast. It's very important that now he's gone. What are we going to do with the report? What are we going to do with the concerns? What are we going to do to make the changes that we need to see in the UK? So we launched it in December, and since then we've done four things. And I want to uh, share these four things with you in case any of them sound interesting for you guys to explore here at HRV. So the first, the first one is a pledge for social rights. This is, this is quite simple. We, we brought four, four things, four messages to try to get as many people as possible behind this message, this pledge. And the four things are, it, it took us a while to write them, but basically are four very simple ideas. We believe that we are entitled to a right to health, housing, social security, and education. We believe we are entitled to that. We believe public authorities are, have the duty to meet my rights to health, to housing, to social security. We believe that if, if public authorities are not meeting that, I should be able to go to court and claim redress, and we believe that people must be listened to. So these four things, I'm entitled to these rights, you public authorities should respect that. If you don't respect that, I should be able to go to court, and whatever that you do, you have to listen to. Yeah, Three, that's, in essence, that's what the pledge is about. And it's about trying to get as many people as possible in the northeast of England to be behind this message. But that clearly is not enough. So second thing, campaigning workshops. These are some pictures, that's me, here, with my colleague Anya, who is my colleague who works there in, 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 in Newcastle. And these are some pictures from uh, workshops that we've been doing with, uh, with activists, with people like yourselves, uh, people who are volunteers of different charities, or simply people who are struggling with universal credit. Uh, by the way, Newcastle was the first uh, large city in, in the UK where universal credit was fully rolled out. So they really know how painful it is. So we've been organizing these workshops about with two purposes really. One, to raise awareness about the existence of social rights, about the existence of you know what Olson has been saying and the and the standards, that's first. And the second goal is to, to do something about it, to identify the issues that people really care the most about. Not in abstract terms, but really the things that matter to them uh, locally. And I think the things that matter to them in the Northeast are similar to the things that matter to you guys here based on what I heard. Earlier. Two things that come very frequently are come up very frequently are uh, transport and cuts public transport, the bus, 
and uh, closure of libraries. And I'm pretty sure that these are things that are also relevant uh, in, uh, in Essex. So these are just two pictures from two events that we had last two weeks ago in Durham and Newcastle. And then on Wednesday next week, we have another one in Middlesbrough. All right, third thing, the social economic duty and the local elections. So I, I don't know whether you guys had local elections on 2nd of May, did you? That's what right. okay. because it, it wasn't in the whole in the whole of the country. So in the in 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 the northeast of the twelve local authorities, ten of them had local elections. So what did we do? We got in touch with every single candidate standing in the local elections in these ten authorities, or with as many of them as we could. We got in touch with them, not on our own, not just just that but also the Equality Trust and Thrive, which is a, is a membership group in, in Teesside uh, of people who are struggling to be themselves out in campaigners. And we got in touch together with as many of the candidates as possible. And we asked them, if you guys are elected, do you pledge to implement the social economic duty in your local authority? And we explained to them what the local social economic duty is. And it will take me a while to explain to you what it is, but it's basically one clause in the Equality Act that since 2010, the UK government has ignored. They have acted as if it wasn't there. They have pretended it's not there. And it imposes a duty on local authorities to ensure that they document how much their policies are increasing inequalities. Yeah? So it's about inequality. It's about inequality locally. Yeah? And the government has ignored the duty altogether. But, they are, but, but councils, if they want to, they can implement it voluntarily. It's not legally required, but they can implement it voluntarily. So we have asked councillors and candidates if you get elected, will you push internally for this to happen? And we got 58 councillors and candidates uh, making the pledge. I mean, 58 out of about 360, you know, it's a minority, but we get in there. We get in there. We, 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 we need any more, but we get in there. So now we're doing the work with a follow-up to try to, to remind them, hey, you know, in April you said you were going to do this. Are you really going to do it now that you were elected? So now we are at that stage. And the fourth thing, it's motions passed by local authorities. So we, we have worked with uh, councillors in the 12 local authorities in the northeast, and we drafted a motion for them so they could pass in, in uh, uh, locally. And, uh, and the motion is about uh, uh, taking, urging the government to take seriously the report by Philip Alston, implementing the social economic duty, and reversing some of the cuts introduced with welfare reform. This is basically what the motion is about. It's a little bit longer than that. But in essence, that's what we ask them, ask them to do. And so far, we have no Tyneside, South Tyneside, Newcastle, and Middlesbrough, and dot, 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 because I'm pretty sure that we only have four at the moment. So I'm pretty sure we have a little more work, we will get some more. So these are just some ideas. Pledge, some workshops to raise awareness and to, and to mobilize people. Uh, the campaign with, with, with uh, councillors to make them implement the, so the social economic duty and the quality act in full. And the emotions with local authorities. You may get, you guys may have different ideas, but this is working quite well. I'm pretty sure that in a year, if I come back, I'll be able to tell you some more things. All right. Thank you.
last year and we spoke, I'm interested in what you were saying to our local district councillor, so very interested. So if you'll give us some information on that, you might ask the question of seven district councillors, so make sure we don't get anything. I'm interested in asking questions. What do you give with those councillors up in Yeah, about the social economic duties specifically, yes. yeah. So, uh, well, I mean, we, we, I'd be very happy to share both things. So the motion. Yes, if you can't, somebody they can share with it. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to send you the motion, and if you guys can switch it internally, that'd be great. If you can send it to me, then what I'll do is I'll give you my details later. Um, and but even mm -hmm. so, if you give it um, the same to our own way, how do we get to engage to implement one of these workshops? For the workshops? Yeah. Uh, so they actually, yeah, that's a yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. So the workshops at the moment, uh, we are delivering the workshops, of course, entirely for free. This is part of what we believe in and what we do. So it's entirely free, and uh, and sometimes we even provide some coffee and tea if we can afford it. So so we're doing it for free. Um, but at the moment, we we are working on a, what we call a conversations toolkit. So it's about trying to write down how we do it, so how we prepare the workshops, in, so you guys or anyone. And use it and and develop the same workshop with whatever changes you guys want to make, but just so so you don't have to create your reinvent the wheel every time you time you do it. So we're writing it down so everyone can use it. We don't have it ready yet, but hopefully within a month or two, we'll have uh, these ready for all activists around the country to use. So you've already had a, a, an effective workshop. Yes, we have had two, and we're having a third one. But these are we we organize them, we we deliver them, but so. We want other people to be able to deliver them themselves. No, I understand that. Um, so, yeah. so just on what you've actually learned so far, could you not send that on? Because obviously we're eager um, to get something like that going. I mean, yeah, I am yeah. Uh, a campaign activist, as um, Nicole knows. Um, and one thing that none of you actually hit on at all was as regards to the equal opportunities that the 1950s women are not receiving as regards to their pension. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that is the thing that I actively fight on locally. Yeah. Um, I actually fight on quite a few things, but one of the other things, and this is why I'm saying Kenyan Council are not receptive at all, um, I was fighting on the street lighting, which is a big issue here. Um, and at one of the meetings, it was a case of, as like here tonight, you had your hand up um, to ask your question. And the chairperson went all the way around and totally avoided me. And then said, uh, and as we move on, and I said, excuse me, as we move on, I said, excuse me, be quiet. So I said, excuse me, do, do we the public not have the right to be heard? No. But the big mistake was we actually had, and, and she knew at the time that she thought it had gone, we had the BBC recording. <laughs> and as I actually left, because I was being evicted, right? As I actually left, the camera sent and I said, Oh, here comes Mrs. Smith, blah blah. We must have an answer. So they said, and what's the answer on the street lighting? I said, I wouldn't know, so we thrown out and that went out live on the television. But I have never, ever received an apology from chairperson of Bisley Army. You never spoke about logistics, didn't you? Total ignorance. So if you know, Councillor Casey can get public money, please, I can help you in a way that we can help. Very, very grateful. Well, look, the, the workshop, I mean, would be um, absolutely amazing. Like, it would be not, yeah. not just for the housing problem, but for lots of issues that mm -hmm. we've actually got here, and try and get people actually out on the street then. Mm -hmm. Just very, very quickly, as you wanted to respond, and he's been very patient, but I'll just out of interest, the, the things that Carla has talked about, the workshops and the other ones, put, put your hand up if you'd be interested in getting involved in that kind of thing. That's really encouraging. So, I mean, I think what's really important is we stay in touch with each other. So if people want to leave their names, uh, write their names down, we have a, a list of people, because if they're going to run this kind of initiative, 
we want numbers we want people to turn up so you know that's really really good and different groups we can work together so uh, sorry about that and i just want to say really really briefly that, that um that picks up on a number of things that people have said and, and resonates with what danny was saying about the hatchet club um, i was a human rights person long before i ever heard of human rights and i was a human rights person because like you i grew up in an environment where people kept telling me all the time i'm shit Right? Teachers told me I'm shit. Um, police officers told me I'm shit. Local councils would say you're shit. You, you mean nothing to me. I don't care about you. One of the most important things, there are two obstacles to the kind of activism that's required in order to bring about change. Two obstacles, apathy, but also the ways in which people who are treated like crap can slowly internalize a diminished sense of self-worth. Don't think any longer that you actually are entitled to be treated properly. That actually, I'm not shit. It's just you're not a very good teacher. You don't provide me with decent education. I'm not shit. I live in poor housing that you're responsible for. So I think it's really important. It does resonate strongly, I think, with, with some of what Danny was saying about the happy club. That sense of self worth, actually, is absolutely crucial. And human rights is a legal thing, it's a political thing, it's about campaigning, and all those things are absolutely crucial. But it starts with a state of mind. And the state of mind is, I'm not crap. I'm, I'm just as respectable and just as worthy as you are. But you need to treat me in a more respectful and more effective, more effective way. So, Tony, please. Well um, said. Our Tony Grafton's Policing Team up on the page. Um, we've got similar issues over there as you have. Um, and it's focusing on those. And getting the same response from the TDC, uh, which is terrific support. But I'm actually part of the conference of Crohn's community of practice. Uh, that is so different to the response from TDC. And it's not really a question, it's more kind of, I wonder if you can sort of identify your successes with your relationship with CBC and see if that can be transferred over here when you start negotiating with TDC because there does seem to be a vast difference in how things are running. It's ridiculous. You know, our borders are, are, are right next to each other. And, and of course, there's a, a crossover of staff from, from Culture Borough Council to the TDC. You know, it's, it's ridiculous that, that there's such a vast difference. But there's a thing in, in um, that, that some of my, 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 my uh, colleagues will know called Human Rights City. It's a network of human rights cities. And it's basically um, places like York, Barcelona, um, where the local authorities and local politicians commit to respecting human rights in the way that the just mayor of Congo was describing in terms of the, uh, the North East Alliance. Commit to respecting human rights. We are working at um, a very, very early stage with Office of Borough Council to encourage them to move in that in that direction. Are you aware of community of practice? No, actually, you should. No. You should connect. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, that would be nice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, this bit will you, please? Uh, just one simple question, slightly uh, personal, but going back to the street dance, I recently.
Firstly, I'd like to ask Andrew a question. And firstly, Andrew, I want to thank you for working alongside us as United Community yes. and putting on this event tonight. So thank you. I would just like. <laughs> yes, yes, everybody involved. Thank you. I would just like to ask, as we've what we've learned through the, the last two meet, the meeting in November and the meeting from tonight, what do you think the next steps should be in moving forward, and how, as you, as an organisation, will be able to support us as United Community and the community of Jaywick in moving forward. So we, um, we, uh, we're going to arrange a brainstorming session on, on campus for um, late September, early October, which will be the next available time for us. And we're going to invite various people yes. from here, from the, the new organisations we've been working with, um, to talk, sit down, identify the core issues, and then identify um, foundations initiatives to support your campaigning, campaigning work. So that's the, the first obvious and the most important landmark yeah. next step. Um, what and then we at? Sorry, what were the at? Uh, at the university, at the wow. university. Um, the most important thing is for you to be speaking to your to your local community representatives, for you to be feeding back the things that are most important to you. The reason we distributed the survey at the very beginning was again to get some sense of the human rights issues that are most important to you. Um, there are, we had a meeting myself and her area is, is, is trusts and foundations, so she knows that there are trusts and foundations out there that are awarding relatively large sums of money, in some cases very large sums of money, to support precisely this kind of this kind of work. So that's the that's one of the next steps that we've been working with other organisations as well, Rob, uh, at these different levels of local authorities and uh, and, 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 and uh, religious organisations. <coughs>
we try and reach out to everyone, all ages, pensioners. So um, I think Nick wants to say a few words, and then we're going to thank everyone for winding down. And thanks very much for everyone. Yes, yeah, I just want to thank everyone for coming out tonight. I know it's not easy. Oh, it's all right, I found out. Yeah, I've got that here. Yeah, I've been.